T E R E M. Terem. Uh, hi, I'm Scott. I'm the CEO and founder of Terem. I'm here with Prashant, and we're going to talk about uh, API and specifically find out from Prashant, who works with APIs every day from all different banks. Uh, we're going to find out. We're going to ask a few questions about API and learn about like where API is important, what makes an API good, easy to work with, a few things like that. So I'm going to kick off. I'm going to do a quick intro uh, to Prashant for you all. And so uh, Prashant is uh, an engineer with Google Pay in India. And Prashant is responsible for technical integration between Google Pay and Google Pay's partners. So an example of partner is like the State Bank of India. And Prashant will work on making sure that payments processed through Google Pay can integrate and work with the different banks' payment processes in the country. So Prashant, you get to see a lot of APIs, I'm guessing. That's right, Scott. Hey, hi, and uh, thanks for the intro. Um, so yes, I do work a lot with the partner banks and most of my work on all of my work in fact is focused on the APIs that we use to integrate with our partners. And just just for uh, you know the listeners' context, what what's Google Pay's business model? Right. So Google Pay as a product is uh, centered around uh, enabling payments for its users. Um, we we allow users to uh, send and receive money with anyone. Right. Uh, Google Pay enables a lot of payment capabilities like peer to peer payments where a user can send money to another user. Uh, Google Pay also allows users to make payments to merchants. So for example, if you're at an online store or, or at an offline store and during a checkout, uh, instead of using cash or instead of reaching out for your card, you could make payments directly from within the app itself, right, using the Google Pay app. So these are some of the capabilities that, uh, the, uh, th this is what Google Pay is built around. Um, in addition to this, Google Pay allows uh, uh, payments, uh, anything that's related to payments during the, uh, to help out with any commerce related requirements, right? Uh, so for example, uh, things like even paying your monthly bills. Uh, when a user has to pay the monthly bills, you are making a payment. Or the, when the user is paying their mobile bills or the utilities or even recharging the mobiles, um, a payment is made. So Google helps the user with all that payment related requirements and solutions. And uh, this, is, this is basically the core of what Google Pay does. Yeah, yeah. And so you're uh, heavily reliant on the APIs of others effectively in order to fulfill a transaction. So if I go to pay uh, using Google Pay, uh, in, in India in particular, I go to pay for a, a bill for one of my utilities or something through Google Pay, what you're doing is taking that and communicating with the, the um, well, there's a lot of people in the value chain on transaction processing, but let's just say you're communicating with the bank. And to do that, you've got to use their API, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, in terms of what I described before, right, uh, it's important to understand that Google Pay is neither a bank, nor is it the utility that the user is uh, interacting with, right? So which means Google Pay is bringing the, the product, and we have a, you know, the, you, uh, a long history of building great products, right? Simple and easy to use products. So we are bringing that experience and we are, we are uh, helping uh, the huge user base that we have, the reach that we have with users, Whereas the partners that we're working with, they bring in the functionality, right? So the banks are the ones that is going to help make the payments. So we partner with the banks. The utilities are the ones that is going to be receiving these payments and maybe forward it to the specific utility. So we partner with bill payment services. And all of this partnership has to be done using APIs, right? So the technical integration in order to make this business happen and make this functionality work is done through APIs. And, and um, when, when you're thinking about a partner to work with, to integrate with, to pull into this system, how big of a weighting factor is the API, you know, the easy integration, ease of documentation? How important is that in your consideration around who to work with? And I guess how, how to work with, how to prioritize? <laughs> right. Um, it definitely becomes very important, right? So the first thing is, I mean, APIs are a given. Without APIs, there's nothing that you can do. So if a partner doesn't support good APIs or easy APIs that we can consume, then it's a no starter. Um, there are partners who have the technology that allows them to build these APIs or maybe expose the APIs, but they may not be as agile, uh, right? So it may take them a while to actually expose these APIs, in which case 
Uh, and again, this becomes a business decision, right? So if it's going to take one year to get started since the time that we uh, start talking about getting into a partnership, then it's a call that we have to take, right? So um, these are a lot of things that we look out for in terms of how mature their API uh, uh, systems are, uh, right? Are they able to expose APIs in a way that we want to do? Now, uh, what we have here is, this is an ecosystem, right? It's a symbiotic relationship. So like I said, Google is bringing the experience. We know what kind of experience we want to give to our users, right? And we need APIs that will help us enable the same experience. Now, if the APIs are very rigid, then it makes it difficult for us because we cannot integrate into those APIs and provide the experience that we want for our users, right? So in a way, we need the APIs to be uh, to be just that, right? To be modern APIs that serve specific functionalities, that, that breaks up the functionality into smaller APIs that we can consume and build and stitch experiences around using these APIs. So this becomes very important. And what, what are the kind of the, you know, for, for someone... Well, you know, time, time to value there. You know, how quickly can you get a prototype of the experience going on something um, is one, one thing that comes to mind. Like, what, what are some of the good, uh, like, what stands out from some of the best APIs that you've worked with where, you know, you go, you kind of came in, you looked at it, and you're like, oh, well, we, we could have something going. This might be extreme, but we could have something going in months or weeks instead of, instead of a year. What did that experience look like? And how would you characterize the API? Right. Um, if you look at the APIs, there are two kinds of, let's say, maturity of the APIs that are exposed, right? One are APIs that are really open and public with a lot of documentation, self-service, you look at it, you consume it, you see samples, and you start uh, working with it. Whereas there are other kind of APIs where there's a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, regulation, maybe, uh, and some sort of a business uh, decisions that need to be involved before you can start consuming them, right? But to what you said, right, in terms of getting started, definitely what we're looking for is firstly, some kind of documentation and examples, uh, ease to understand APIs, right? And it may not be comprehensive documentation, but even if it's self-explanatory, when you look at the URLs, when you look at the uh, request parameters, the response parameters, how easy it is to understand and consume it. That definitely is uh, helps the time to get started with the APIs. Also very important is being able to actually use these APIs, test it out, right? So some sort of a sandbox, some yeah. sort of a test environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a you know the sandbox environment fascinates me in 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 uh, regulation and that financial services land because a lot of the environments even to get a sandbox are behind. You know, I need to go get approvals and I need someone to sign off and but but uh, um, or there's a sandbox, but it's kind of useless because the data that you can interact with is the same, you get the same response back all the time. It doesn't really give you a real sense of how it's going to work. So it's, it's um, what, what are some things that you've seen partners do to make sandboxes better, especially in this uh, area that you're working in? A, you know, it's highly regulated. We've got money on the line. Yeah. It's, a, it, the, you know, it's transferring money. So there's huge problems around fraud or whatever. What are some of the things you've seen people do to make a sandbox available in that environment? Yeah, so when we work with the partners, we, in fact, uh, 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 set certain expectations with them to help us with integration, right? To help uh, uh, yeah. get started quickly. So there are different levels of sandboxes also. If you um, now, again, as you said, this is a very highly regulated uh, environment. And by the time we get to production, there are a lot of things that need to be in place. For example, you know, encryption, um, SSLs, and these are all, let's say, going to raise the entry barrier to getting started using these APIs, right? So when you work with partners, what we tell them is, you know, if you can give us a sandbox that it can be dummy APIs, but what it helps us is it helps us to, let's say, build a prototype UI around these APIs, right? Prototype experience. So call these APIs, call API 1 and 2, uh, uh, there is, you know, stitch APIs 1, 2, and 3 together, and we are able to determine if the APIs are really catering to the experience that we want to build, right? In this case, it's it's fine. Uh, it may be dummy data, it may be test data, um, and it may not be you know the hundred uh, uh, percent functional APIs in terms of let's say the security encryption and so on, right? But however, it helps us decide if the APIs are suiting the business needs that we want to build, right? The product that we want to build. Then, of course, once we go past that, then you go to the next environment where you go into a more real uh, life like setup where you have bank accounts that are provisioned, but in the test environments of the banks. 
Now, now on one side, there is the APIs and the API sandbox. For the other side, the bank systems have to be, uh, you know, also have these kind of environments where they're able to support this requirement. Yeah, and and then uh, this is really interesting. So for, for you, like, even just a dummy environment that's returning mock data, which is easy to build, right, if you're building an API. Like, you, it's easy to build something in that returns mock data that looks something like the real thing. And what, what you're saying is, like, even that, which is simple to do, is, like, a huge kind of leap up in helping you build a prototype in, I'm guessing, a matter of weeks instead of, you know, waiting a year, not knowing if it's going to work the way you think it's going to work. Exactly, right? And always when we, what, when, when we build products, we start with a user experience that we want to build for, right? And having some sort of APIs helps us plug in into the prototyping tools and actually start looking at the flow and start looking if we can build the user journey that we want. So yes, this absolutely does help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and um, this is this is a, a, a really interesting point because I often see a lot of businesses shying away from the sandbox and, oh, no, no, well, people have to, uh, you know, get in contact with us. And when I say people, I say big, big companies, that, you know, they get nervous, but you know, you can easily set up a sandbox environment outside, you know, the, the corporate network even because it's not, it's just mock data being returned. It's not even real, yep. real data. It's not interacting with anything real. You know, it's probably like not much code kind of thing. You could spin it up on a small GCP instance or some, you know, like something simple like that. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point you make about how much value that gives you as someone working with APIs all the time. What, um, so let's change tack a bit. So we've got documentation, sandbox environment, kind of like right, right up the top there. What things have you seen or... Uh, what you know when it comes to API, what what's not great? Like you know, aside from not having one, um, what what are some things where at first you're like, oh great, they got an API, and then you you run into issues with it? What what things should people avoid doing? Right. Um, so normally, what happens is, uh, uh, especially companies that don't treat APIs as their first class citizen, right, as a first class product. What happens is API is bolted on as an afterthought on top of their core functionality that their systems offer. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an IT integration thing. It, it is, right? And, and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, exactly. Right? It still becomes like, oh, yeah, this is also some uh, a capability that we should have. Right? And that's not the way to think about it, right? We, and, and, you know, we uh, always talk about having API product managers, right? So treat yeah. API as a product and, and bring in all yeah. the capabilities. And these are some of the pain points, right? So not having these capabilities are some of the critical points. So for example, the API works very well in the, uh, in the, in the positive use cases, right? When everything works fine. But what happens if something goes wrong? So the API has not been well thought out and does not give back enough data for me to decide how to handle a negative use case, right? Uh, or a yeah, failure yeah, use yeah. case. So for you as a user, your user experience as the integrating engineer has not been, you know, if a product manager is there and they're thinking about it, they're going to think like, okay, you know, as an engineer integrating with this, I need to know, like, there's a whole experience that you got to go through because you're going to be debugging, deploying against it. Yeah, and you need that thinking in there to help you do a better a better job. Otherwise, you're like, what's error 42738? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Exactly right, and then you 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 are uh, and it's especially bad if this happens once you go into production, right? And hopefully we catch this either in the sandbox or either we catch this in the UAT environments. But this is extremely bad if it goes to production. But this is a thing, right? So not getting very helpful data back from the APIs in case of failure uh, situations is one. The second thing is the APIs themselves could fail, right? I mean, it's it's a technical piece. The APIs may not work. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. the second uh, you know, thing that we see is not enough attention or not enough monitoring or operational rigor given to the APIs by the providers, right? Where you would, they need to be able to detect that the API is not working and they need to be able to figure out what is happening with the APIs, right? Is it an issue with the API? Is it an issue with a particular system in the back end? And they shouldn't wait for the consumer to go and report, hey, your APIs are not working, right? Yeah, and, and so these are some yeah, of the yeah, things yeah. where we face issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are all the... You know, it's interesting you bring this up because when I when you know when I talk to people about API, it's the the positive case is straightforward, and often you know that's where people say, oh yeah yeah okay I'll I'll build that it's fine we'll just add it on we'll just we'll just expose a RESTful endpoint it's just a bit of JSON and some code right and and 
I mean, my big lesson, which is, which you're kind of sharing, is been, it's not. It's so much more than just you know. Here's a JSON response, 200 OK with a few variables. It's like what happens if it goes wrong? How are you going to monitor usage? How are you going to monitor um, who's got access to it? How are you going to de debug this thing? And how are you going to give access to different environments like sandbox or test? Or There's a lot more to it in order to make like the actual response 200 OK with the variables is, is like this little bit. And there's this big, big thing around exactly. there, right? Yep. To, yeah, 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 yep. yeah. Um, no, this, this has been, a, yeah, are there any, so just kind of like wrapping up the conversation, is there anything else that, that you'd want to add about if, if, um, if I'm a financial institution, a fintech, a government, you know, someone in a regulated environment or even not, you know, what, what, what should I be thinking about when I'm thinking about API? I've heard like documentation, product management, thinking of it as a product, monitoring all the things that go around it is there anything else you want to add for our for our listeners and our audience mm -hmm. um right so i think these cover some of the most important aspects in terms of getting started using these apis right um yeah. uh, there's also this part about being able to uh, you know just just giving the apis out there let's say the api is robust is resilient has all these capabilities right sometimes um you building apis and exposing apis is also a journey right and especially in these kind of regulated environments where you're starting off with something, you may not know what is the right way to do certain things, right? Uh, so in this case, again, API is a journey. Like any other product, you might want to have an alpha, beta, and then a final release stages, right? So you also need to work, you need to find the right partners. Uh, you need to work with the right partners in order to build out these APIs, right? It's not just your point of view, but it's also important to understand what the consumers want to see out of these APIs, right? So work with the partners, find the right partners, work with them in order to build version one, version two, or, or version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of these APIs. Um, uh, fine tune and, and build good APIs uh, that you know your consumers would like, like to use. And then yes, focus on all these other capabilities as well by the time you go generally available. And so, yeah, I guess what I'm hearing is like, it's, it's, it's gotta be a journey. It's not a kind of like, hey, we released and now you, know, now you can go and access V1 slash yeah whatever the endpoint is, it's, you're probably going to have to iterate on that quite a bit. And you've got to allow that in, in, in the thinking, in the budgeting, in, um, uh, well, your approach, everything, how you're going to take those APIs to market. They're not, it's not a static thing. Look, um, absolutely. Thanks so much for, for, uh, having the conversation. Um, Prashant, it really is. It was an awesome conversation and, um, yeah, thanks again. Oh, thank you, Scott. Thanks. It was a pleasure talking to you. Bye. See you.